Welcome to part six of President Donald J. Trump reads from, reads beautifully, by the way, from the terrible fake book, Fire and Fury. The excerpts I've been given today are, well, we'll see. We'll read them right now. The first part is on the generals, and then there's stuff on Kellyanne Conway and the beautiful, luscious spokesperson communications chick, Hope Hicks. So we're going to get through that, and it should be a bunch of garbage, but read beautifully by your favorite president. So let's go with the first excerpt. <clears throat> the unique problem here was partly how to get information to someone who did not or could not or would not read. They're obsessed with me reading, like I can't watch TV and, and look at Twitter. How do I read Twitter and write Twitter if I'm so illiterate? <clears throat> and who at best listened only selectively. Well, I listen selectively because sometimes you're not saying interesting things. But the other part of the problem was how best to qualify the information that he liked to get. Hope Hicks, after more than a year at his side, had honed her instincts for the kind of information, the clips that him, the latest outrages against him, that clipped the latest outrage. I don't know. This is very poorly edited. I'll have to talk to Hope Hicks, who gave me all these things. Apparently, she's cutting things out. And there were his after-dinner calls, the billionaire chorus, and then Cable, itself programmed to reach him, to court him or enrage him. The information he did not get was formal information, the data, the details, the options, the analysis. He didn't do PowerPoint. For anything that smacked of a classroom or of being lectured to, professor was one of his bad words. Well, that's true. When I don't like somebody, I call them professor when they're too talky and too much data. And he was proud of never going to class, never buying a textbook, never taking a note. He got up and left the room. This was a problem in multiple respects, indeed in almost all the prescribed functions of the presidency. But perhaps most of all, it was a problem in the evaluation of strategic military options. The president liked generals. That's true. The more fruit salad they wore, the better. The president was very pleased with the compliments he got for appointing generals who commanded the respect that Mattis and Kelly and McMaster were accorded. Pay no attention to Michael Flynn. I pay attention to Michael Flynn. He's a good guy. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm going to pardon him, but Michael, if you're listening to this beautiful reading of the audiobook, I will pardon you. Please don't say anything. What the president did not like was listening to generals who, for the most part, were skilled in the new army jargon of PowerPoint, data dumps, and McKinsey-like presentations. One of the things that endeared Flynn to the president was that Flynn, quite the conspiracist, conspiracist, he was not a racist, and drama queen, had a vivid storytelling sense. By the time of the Syrian attack on Khan Sheikhoun, that sounds made up, McMaster had been Trump's national security advisor for only about six weeks, yet his efforts to inform the president had already become an exercise in trying to tutor a recalcitrant and resentful student. Well, I'm not a student, I'm the president, so you should treat me as such, no, treat me like a student. Recently, Trump's meetings with McMaster had ended up in near acrimony, and now the president was telling several friends that his new national security advisor was too boring and that he was going to fire him. McMaster had been the default choice, a fact that Trump kept returning to. Why had he hired him? He blamed his son-in-law. After the president fired Flynn in February, he had spent two days at Mar-a-Lago interviewing replacements, badly taxing his patients. John Bolton, the former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations and Bannon's consistent choice, made his aggressive, light-up-the-world, go-to-war pitch. Then Lieutenant General Robert L. Caslin Jr., superintendent of the United States Military Academy at West Point, presented himself with what Trump viewed positively as old-fashioned military decorum. Yes, sir. No, sir. That's correct, sir. Well, I think we know China has some problems, sir. And in short order, it seemed that Trump was selling Castlin on the job. That's the guy I want, said Trump. He's got the look. Very good song, by the way, by Roxette. Okay? They, you know, I'm not going to lie. I may, have, I may have had sexual relations with the female in Roxette, but that was a long time ago. But I was a terrific lover. 
But Caslin demurred, his mistake. He had never really had a staff job. Kushner thought he might not be ready. Yeah, but I liked that guy, pressed Trump. Then McMaster, wearing a uniform with his silver star, came in and immediately launched into a wide-ranging lecture on global strategy. Trump was soon and obviously distracted, and as the lecture continued, he began sulking. That guy bores the shit out of me, announced Trump after McMaster left the room. In this fake book, I actually did say that, so maybe 95% maybe of the book is fake, but I actually did. He is boring. McMaster is the McMaster of McBoring. Okay, speaking of which, can somebody go get me McDonald's? I'm hungry. Talking really works up an appetite. But Kushner pushed him to take another meeting with McMaster, who the next day showed up without his uniform and in a baggy suit. He looks like a beer salesman, Trump said, announcing that he would hire McMaster but didn't want to have another meeting with him. Shortly after his appointment, McMaster appeared on Morning Joe. Trump saw the show and noted admiringly, the guy sure gets good press. The president decided he had made a good hire. Which I did. I loved my choice. Great choice. Now we're going to talk about some of the ladies that work. Some of these excerpts. Let's see what lies Fire in the Fury Wolfman has made up about some of the women in the White House. Kellyanne Conway. Love Kellyanne Conway. Conway seemed to have a convenient on-off toggle. In private, in the off position... She seemed to regard Trump as a figure of exhausting exaggeration or even absurdity. Or at least, if you regarded him that way, she seemed to suggest that she might too. She illustrated her opinion of her boss with a whole series of facial expressions. Eyes rolling, mouth agape, agape, that's not a word, head snapping back. But in the on position, she metamorphosed, she metamorphosed, so metamorphosed, metamorphosed, great reader, into believer, protector, defender, and handler. Conway is an anti-feminist, or actually, in a complicated ideological somersault, she sees feminists as being anti-feminists, ascribing her methods and temperament to her being a wife and mother. She's instinctive and reactive, hence her role as the ultimate Trump defender. She verbally threw herself in front of any bullet coming his way. Who's shooting at me? I mean, I appreciate Kellyanne Conway taking, you know, jumping in front. But, you know, we've got to talk. It's probably Comey or these Obama people trying to, trying to shoot me, and I won't have it. Not allowed. Trump loved her defend-at-all-costs shtick. Conway's appearances were on, schedule to, on his schedule to watch live. His was often the first call she got after coming off the air. She channeled Trump. She said exactly the kind of Trump stuff that would otherwise make her put a finger gun to her head. Well, he's just trying to put a, a wedge between me and my, my wonderful Kellyanne Conway, who is really a great defender. But she's not much of a looker, whereas this next lady is quite the looker. My communications director, let's see what they have to say about Hope Hicks in this fake book. Over the 18 months of the campaign, the traveling group usually consisted of the candidate. I think that's me, but I'm the president. Once again, they're calling me the candidate, but I'm actually the president, so fake book. Hicks and the campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski. In time, she became, in addition to an inadvertent participant in history, about which she was quite as astonished as anyone, a kind of Stepford factotum as absolutely dedicated to and tolerant of Mr. Trump as anyone who has ever worked for him. Shortly after Lewandowski, with whom Hicks had an on and off romantic relationship, was fired in June 2016 for clashing with Trump family members, Hicks sat in Trump Tower with Trump and his sons, w worrying done enough for him. Once again, bad ed editing. You're the best piece of tail he'll ever have. I did say that to her, to be honest. Sending Hicks running from the room. As new layers began to form around Trump, first as nominee and then as president-elect, Hicks continued playing the role of his peer personal PR woman. And other things. But I'm not going to say this because, you know, Melania might listen to this. She would remain his constant shadow and the person with the best access to him. Have you spoken to Hope? 
were among the words most frequently uttered in the West Wing. Hicks, sponsored by Ivanka and ever loyal to her, was in fact thought of as Trump's real daughter, while Ivanka was thought of as his real wife. Well, let me tell you something. In a perfect world, they'd both be, you know, we'd be in a, a Mormon kind of fake Mitt Romney plural marriage. I remember watching Big Love. A perfect world, Ivanka and Hope Hicks would both be my wives. And I know you're thinking that's gross, but come on, look at them. More functionally, but as elementally, Hicks was the president's chief media handler. She worked by the president's side, wholly separate from the White House's 40-person strong communications office. Very strong, by the way. The president's personal message and image were entrusted to her, or more accurately, she was the president's agent in retailing that message and image, which he trusted to no one but himself. Together they formed something of a freelance operation. Without any particular politics of her own, and with her New York PR background quite looking down on the right-wing press, she was the president's official liaison to the mainstream media. And by the way, she's also the front-runner for wife number four, if you know what I mean. The president had charged her with the ultimate job, a good write-up in the New York Times. That, in the president's estimation, had yet failed to happen. But hope tries and tries, the president said, on more than one occasion after a day, one of the countless days of particularly bad notices, the president greeted her affectionately with, you must be the world's worst PR person. But she's a beautiful, beautiful woman, and I will put up with a little bit of bad, bad work when she makes it look that good. Okay, And that's not like a Harvey Weinstein thing. I'm just saying I want to have sex with her. And I will tell her she'll lose her job if she doesn't. But that's not a Weinstein thing, okay? He's a, he's a disgusting, democratic, donating scumbag. I'm doing it the right way. MAGA. There was Hope Hicks and the president living in what other West Wing, in other West, where, terrible editing. Hope, if you weren't so good looking, I'd really be pissed with how you've cut and pasted these uh passages. But it's a terrible book. It's poorly edited. Maybe she did a good job and the publishers should be sued and shot. Where past presidents might have spent portions of their day talking about the needs, desires, and points of leverage among various members of Congress, the president and Hicks spent a great deal of time talking about a fixed cast of media personalities trying to second guess the real agendas and weak spots among cable anchors and producers and Times and Post reporters. Often the focus of this otherworldly ambition was directed at Times reporter Maggie Haberman. Hab Haberman's front page beat at the paper, which might be called the weirdness of Donald Trump beat, involved producing vivid tales of eccentricities, questionable behavior, and shit the president says, told in a knowing deadpan style. Beyond acknowledging that Trump was a boy from Queens yet in awe of the Times, Nobody in the West Wing could explain why he and Hicks would so often turn to Haberman for what would so reliably be a mocking and hurtful portrayal. There was some feeling that Trump was returning to scenes of past success. The Times might be against him, but Haberman had worked at the New York Post for many years. She's very professional, Conway said, speaking in defense of the president and trying to justify Haberman's extraordinary access. But however intent, he remained on getting good ink in the Times. The president saw Haberman as mean and horrible, and yet on a near weekly basis, he and Hicks plotted when next to have the Times come in. And I stand by that, and Haberman, she's disgusting and not very bright, and I have to get off this uh, part of the call, uh, part of this audiobook, because I actually have a two-hour interview scheduled with Maggie Haberman right now. So come back for part seven beautiful reading of the terrible fake fire and fury book by your president donald j trump <laughs>